to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Woo! <laughs> Woo! Tuesday, June 9th. The Fantasy Footballers back with you. Mike Wright is here. Yes. I am here. Andy Holloway. Yes. That's me. That's me. And then uh, it may not look... Oh, there he is. Jason Moore is present as well in in spirit, not in body. In voice, not in body. Virtual body is probably best for me anyways. <laughs> so this is great news. Yeah, I told Jay Grizz, get out of my life. Got a stuffy nose, being cautious, staying home, and yet still here for the Foot Clan. Yeah, and we're thankful for that. It, it's going to be a great show. We're talking fantasy wild cards today. Mm. Some mailbag. We got some big news to talk about as well. But yeah, it's a new day. I mean, if you get a sniffle and a sneeze, you stay at home. Just get out of my life, Jay. Yeah. But uh, we have a great show. We also have uh, Judge Giamatti's at home. So we've got Al Borland running... Uh, the, the, the ones and twos. The ones and twos <laughs> back there. But we are here a little bit later than a normal episode. But we gave the staff the day off yesterday as kind of a makeup for Memorial Day. We were pushing the UDK, and obviously the UDK was released on the 1st. And so we gave them the day off, and here we are mm -hmm. with lots to talk about. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, yes. And if you're watching on YouTube... Which is uh, youtube.com slash the fantasy footballers. You'll see Mike is wearing a uh, a Vikings cap. Yes, I, I I am a Vikings fan of the Cardinals are my number one team, but I still have a burning love for Minnesota Vikings as my number two team. And I mean it's we're actually kind of serendipitous that we are recording the today's show a little bit later than normal, because in the off season very often we pre record the day earlier. Would we have even had this news, had the show come out at the regular time? Probably not. Probably it, not. So you're welcome. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll get into that. Let, let's start with a quick question, though. By the way, you can follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. A reminder, we have a giveaway right now, footclangiveaway.com, a signed Devontae Adams jersey mm. over there. Lots of you are entering. We'll give that away at the end of this month. But here's the quick question. It comes from Instagram. He says, what advice, this is from C. Harper 711. I would have called him Charper. Or Charper. I don't know, though. It, it's possible it's Carper. Yeah, it could, well. yeah, it could, could be. be. Carper. <laughs> oh. uh, what advice would you have for someone who is in a rebuild in a dynasty league? Jason, let's turn to you first. What advice would you give to somebody who's going through a rebuild in their dynasty league? Yeah, so if you're in a rebuild and your team's not good enough to compete, there's several things you're going to need to do. And, you know, one is you're going to trade the older veterans for the highest draft picks you can, right? If you're not going to win in the next year or two, a list of guys would be like Adam Thielen, Robert Woods, T.Y. Hilton, uh, Keenan Allen. These guys are all, you know, 28, 29, 30 years old, where three three years from now when you're ready to rock you're you know they they're not going to help you anymore so those are the types of pieces you rebuild and i would i would say a pro tip is wait to trade them wait until you know which teams just need that guy to push themselves over the top towards a championship and they're willing to give up their great you know uh picks to to you know you 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 end up getting a one instead of a two for some of these guys because they're willing to uh, you know push through and i would also say and this is fortuitous with the news of today you might be a a good team to buy low on guys who are suspended or holding out so if you know if all of a sudden a couple weeks from now it's reported Dalvin Cook's totally ready to miss the whole season uh, if he doesn't have a contract, maybe that Dalvin Cook owner is willing to sell him lower than you could usually buy a young piece like that. So if you can buy low, and then the great news is, you hope he sits out because you're, I mean, tank responsibly, right? You want you want that uh, you want that great uh, pick next year, which means put a put a lineup up. But oh oh no, my starter's holding out. And I, I would say, whoa, yeah <laughs> yeah, I would say too, you know, just to piggyback on that. You, 
people in a rebuild sometimes feel like they are destined to defeat for multiple years, which might be the case with the way that your league lays itself out. But if you're trading those pieces that you're talking about, Jason, you can piece victories together in a dynasty league with the most aged and most decrepit and one year left type of players. So if you're sending an Adam Thielen out and you're getting a draft pick, but you can have a Jamison Crowder tossed in or somebody that is Julian Edelman, who we'll talk about later on the show, that people just look for, those guys are dead in a dynasty league. You can piece victories together with old guys that no one cares about during, you know, because there, there's a certain category of dynasty uh, player that is kind of a hands-off player, right? Where sure. people don't want uh, to touch them anymore. The AJ Greens, maybe. Maybe it's the one-year rentals of Mark Ingram or somebody like that. So you don't have to resign yeah. yourself to defeat. At least I don't. I think you there can are, compete in a rebuild. I think there are different kinds of rebuilds, right? There is the complete blow it up rebuild where you are your team is not good. Like enough. Mike's and, dynasty team last year. Mm -hmm. Sure, I mean he was yes. in the championship a couple years earlier. His team was good, but then uh, you know people aged out and injuries happen, and uh, you know so then sometimes you need to blow it up. And if you're blowing it up, you don't piece together those victories. I think for the most part, the three of us usually try to rebuild on the fly like as we are still winning and and that would be a good tip for that type of a rebuild to always still have a chance at getting in the playoffs and and sneaking that championship and i would i would say go after backup running backs because generally you can get them cheaper i mean you're not going to be able to go and get alexander madison very very cheap right now but had you gone and tried to trade for him last year the, it would have been a lot different of a situation. And just these, like, uh, 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 P. Ryan, LaMichael P. Ryan for the New York Jets. Right now, he's Le'Veon Bell's backup. Right now, he has basically no fantasy value because you would project that Le'Veon Bell's going to get almost every single snap for that team. But is, is Lev Bell on that team in two years? Is, P. Ryan, does he have the shot to become a starter? Those are the types of players that you can get uh, on the cheap on, seas, on the yeah. cheap uh, compared to paying for starters. If if you're if you know you can't win, then yeah, then you guys, like, get this team that will get better over time as they as they mature into starting positions. Yeah, and, and you know, early in the off season, Mike, you brought up several names of guys who are coming into that year where the holdout could happen, right? Um, and, and you could target their backups. Like you just said, you can't get Alexander Madison now. You can't. But you could get Latavius Murray and Gio Bernard and other guys where Mixon and Kamara have not said they're holding out right. yet. You know, you, you can you can trade for some of those guys or even a year out, look at the, the next year's draft class. Jason, would you like to blow your dynasty team up? Uh, man, I think as the back-to-back -back champ going for champ, 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 I will not... <laughs> be blowing trying that to thing Jordan up. I right be, now I, he's darn right darn right I need I need that uh, I would that walk trilogy. away and start playing fantasy baseball <laughs> that's what I would do yeah I think that's the that's solution right now all right let's get into the news news and notes from around the league all right the big news Dalvin Cook will not participate in any team activities until he receives what he called a reasonable new contract uh, this is from ESPN's Adam Schefter and other sources. He is out without a reasonable contract extension. He is not showing up for camp or beyond. Oof. So There's one of the most difficult <laughs> off-season situations to be in as a fantasy owner. We've been here before. We've been here with Lev. We've been here with Zeke in a slightly different fashion. But where you don't know the future, obviously, the team seems exceptionally yoked to Dalvin Cook in its offensive strategy in what it wants to do. He's been as productive as any running back in football. And he's sitting here at the, he's got like a, a $1.3 million contract for his final year. His quarterback's making 30 million a year and he's taking a stand. Yeah. And I do not blame him at all. So this is certainly, I'm always on the team of player, go get the bag, go get it when you can. But for us, as breaking it down for fantasy purposes, we have to be we we kind of have to put on our business cap. Okay, let's think realistically. Dalvin Cook 
has not a ton of leverage. I mean, the, the leverage he has is saying, look what I've done for your team on the field. Look how much better the team is when I am playing, when I'm your starting running back. But if he sits out with, with the way that the, the new collective bargaining agreement works, one, he needs to report sooner. Like holdouts, it's, it's a much different situation than it was in the past. Two, if he in fact chooses to hold out, he would become a restricted free agent, and, which means that like, like he's, he's not in a position like Le'Veon Bell was, where if he sits out a year, he just gets to walk and go wherever he wants. It, so he, he doesn't he doesn't have that type of contractual leverage. He's he's in more of a what well, Melvin Gordon type of situation right. was in. And we've been down this road where gambling on Lev's return was devastating for fantasy owners. Gambling on Zeke's return paid off in spades if you bought him in that interim period of sure. doubt. But then Melvin Gordon, you know, it took took weeks into the season. So you know, the question for us, you know, you got the ultimate draft kit, our rankings, our projections, our thought process around risk. Where do you guys adjust Cook today? How do you view him today? Because he was in that upper tier of starters at the running back position. So if you're drafting in a in a best ball league, if you're drafting uh, in a dynasty league, are you are you afraid? Right. Oh, go yeah. ahead, Jay. Yeah, I I would be very afraid. I mean, when you're in that tier of player where Dalvin Cook has been going, all the players around him are also great. I'm taking the other great players who don't have, you know, Dalvin Cook before this holdout was already a, a very risky, you know, very high reward, but a very risky player with his shoulder injuries. So now he is the riskiest player in fantasy football this year. The the shoulder combined with the holdout combined with the draft cost says he is he's too risky for me to have on a team right now, unless he's like, Sure, if he drops to the third or fourth round, uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Then, not, then I'm not choosing between you know him and Alvin Kamara. Well, let me, uh, you know, I'm I'm choosing between him and some you know replaceable option. Are you so dra- I, I, are you yeah. drafting Kenyon Drake ahead of Dalvin Cook today? Because that's right at that line where you know I think the uh, the ADP of yeah, Kenyon Drake might be. If I was on the clock right now and I could only pick those two players, I would take Kenyon Drake. Oof. I think Cook gets a deal done. Yeah, I I lean on the side that I'm I have lowered him in the projections a bit because we we just have a history, right, of players when they say they're going to hold out in recent history, they hold out. So, I am taking the news report serious, certainly. But we we are so far out of anything actually happening. We don't even know when training camp is going to start. This is the perfect time for Dalvin Cook to to flex what, the little levers that he has of saying, guys, I'm, I don't care when camp is. I'm not going to show up unless you give me a contract. So as of right now, I still think Dalvin Cook will be back. If I, but, but I mean, if I'm in a draft right now like Jason, it's – it would be very difficult to do that, knowing that, knowing the risk what that Dalvin Cook is bringing to my team of not even being there. He's just sitting on the bench while I can't do anything about it. And I have to wait for him to come back. Then all the things of players that if they're not in a training camp, is their body ready to go? It or is is it a slow start? Right. Is it, Jason's point about the injury is significant as well. Yes, because Cook has dealt with it. And we love Dalvin Cook. We love the player on the field when he's healthy and ready to go. But the, there are some variables in place that has ra- that have raised his risk to a point where, if you can choose somebody of a similar tier, you should. Yeah, and his and the Minnesota Vikings cap situation is not the best. Uh, Dalvin Cook is lucky that Stephon Diggs got traded. If like if Stephon Diggs is there, and Dalvin Cook says I'm holding out without a deal. Dalvin Cook is holding out because they're they're not going to be able to pay him. They can they can figure out a way to get it done, but this is a very very high risk situation. And there were there were talks about Cook getting an extension well before this declaration, right? But apparently they have not had. You know, yeah, you know, three weeks ago the talk was, oh, we've had some productive talks. This seems to be the next step of negotiation. So yeah. many times where once those talks slow down, it's like here here's how. Our proposals are reasonable. 
Right. You, you need to accept a reasonable. Now, who knows what reasonable means? It means two different things. But uh, other news, and we'll be following the Dalvin Cook situation closely. Todd Gurley finally uh, was able to fly to Atlanta, pass his physical. All right. Yes. <laughs> Step one. <laughs> Jason's on. Jason's back. You're happy he passed. Well, it's his one of those things Jason. where it's like, I've been a pro Todd Gurley's fantasy value this offseason supporter. <laughs> I think the receptions are coming, and it's always been on the back of my mind. It's like, well, he has not yet even passed his physical. So this is just, you know, this is like a prerequisite class that is. Uh, I've graduated, and now I get to go to the class I was trying to get. There to. are only a certain number of players in the NFL where passing the physical is a real benchmark. <laughs> <laughs> for their potential. It is good that that took place. We've got the uh what the hype train video of him on the the arthritic knee lifting a bunch of weight. Have you seen this Mike? I have, I have not, but You've not seen it. the season for is <laughs> the season for workout videos to get us all really excited. So, yeah, the the more you post those, the higher your ADP goes. That's how it works. Yep. But it's good. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Correct. So, uh, okay, another big piece of news that, that kind of broke towards the end of last week, head coach Bruce Arians, Tampa Bay, said that 12 personnel will be the Buccaneers' base offense. Hmm. So a base offense of 12 personnel means you've got two tight ends on the field. That means you have two wide receivers on the field. That also means that Chris Godwin is not in, in the slot more than likely. So they have – This is weird They have Rob Gronkowski. They have O.J. Howard. They're, they have no, Cameron Bray. Too. Yeah, yeah. Being base personnel, though, the you know, I I think last year the the team that led the league was under forty percent in twelve personnel. So uh, I think that was the Eagles. It's not. I I don't think this means that you know seventy five percent of the time they're going to have two tight ends on the field. I just don't think that's realistic in in today's he, NFL. Here, here's what I would say, and that's a good point. But one of the question marks around this team is predictability. Jameis Winston's gone. Tom Brady is there. Tom Brady functions in a certain type of offense, and the older Tom Brady gets, there are certain types of schemes and systems that benefit him. So the variability is present for whether Godwin can repeat, whether Evans will repeat. Right. Uh, you know, like you said, they're not going to, and Bruce Arians is not an idiot for so far. I mean, <laughs> he's not an idiot. He's not going to take a successful Chris Godwin and say, yeah, you know, we're going to move you to a place you're going to be completely unsuccessful. I and, think we all agree he's a talented wide receiver. He can play on the outside. And, and Jay, according to Sharp Football, Philadelphia was in 12 personnel 52% of the time. They were the the highest. They were the leader, yes, right? Yes, they were the leader. Okay. So Where was so Tampa I last guess year? that is oh. the example here is the best in the NFL was, you know, 50% of the time. So I don't think this is – that matters a Some lot, though, for a player off. that you're banking at number five or six a wide receiver, does it not? No, I, I don't think it does because I, I don't think – I think what you just said about Chris Godwin and how he dominated in the slot and Tom Brady and how he utilizes a dominant slot wide receiver, Wes Welker, Julian Edelman, like that, it's just not going to go away. What it does do is it kind of builds up – the Gronk getting on the field more or being more important to the offense. I don't think this – I don't. I did not read this news as something that scared me off of Chris Godwin. And last year, Tampa Bay was in 12 personnel uh, 23% of the time. Okay. All right. Interesting. All right. Uh, Titans offensive coordinator Arthur Smith said uh, Derrick Henry's workload for the upcoming season depends on how the games go. That's news? Yep. Um. <laughs> Doesn't all workloads depend on how the games go? <laughs> Breaking news. Hey, you know, Brooke, we're Brooks going to run the Brooks ball isn't more present when right now. But yeah. if he was, I might make fun of him. Well, we but can, I would we never can, do that now. Yeah, never. Never talk about how that, that was a stupid piece of news to talk about, Brooks. Hey, I guess you know we have said it on the show yep. a lot that if they don't win, Derrick Henry's value is not going to match his ADP. Before we get into the fantasy wild cards, I want to thank today's sponsor, Omaha Steaks. Omaha. Mm. Delivering the world's best steaks and a huge variety of other favorites directly to Dad's door because Father's Day is approaching rapidly. Get pops some meat from Omaha Steaks. 
Look at the, the variety of Father's Day packages. They include world famous steaks, burgers, franks, sausages, perfect for grilling, poultry, pork, side dishes, one step family deals. I love Omaha steaks. Uh, when I look I- in my fridge and I see a dwindling supply of my Omaha steaks, burgers. You get a little panicky? I, I get a little little anxious. Yeah. A little bit of anxious yeah, I get it. anxiety inside because they're delicious. Uh, I love grilling up my Omaha Steaks burgers. And right now, Omaha Steaks is offering our listeners access to a variety of amazing packages that are perfect to send dad for Father's Day. Go to omahasteaks.com, enter the code FOOTBALLERS into the search bar. You'll see all the great options available, many that include free shipping and a free one-pound package of their perfectly cured, incredibly thick, applewood smoked steak cut bacon. There are many packages available that are perfect for dad. They're all ready to be shipped straight to his door in time for Father's Day. Visit omahasteaks.com. Type footballers in the search bar to shop for Father's Day today. All right, let's talk fantasy wild cards. No, I'm saying, no, the brakes. Guys, why are the brakes working? Because I cut the brakes. Wild card. Yeah. All right, how do you define a fantasy wild card, Mike? I would say fantasy wild card is a player where you're, when you're building out their projection, uh, you realize that <laughs> they could exceed that by a lot or, or, or they could come short uh, by also a lot. Like the, the range of outcomes for this player is very hard to narrow down to a just a nice – Middle ground, a nice median. predictability. Yes, we just talked about Leonard Fournette on the last episode. He right, fits that criteria. Yeah, he he certainly does right now. His predictability, uh, his range of outcomes should shrink as time goes on because that's that's one of the big factors in Leonard Fournette is what exactly are the Jaguars going to do at the running back position because they could be a wild card at, in August. All of a sudden, there's another running back on this team that. But these players that we're talking about right now, their situations are pretty locked in, and it's still hard to see which, which side of the projection are they really going to hit. I'll let Jason kick this off. We each selected a couple of players that we're having, you know, we're having some uh, conflicting thoughts about. Maybe difficult to rank individually. We can surface these guys, discuss them on the show today. Love to hear from the Foot Clan. On Twitter at the FF Ballers, Jason, who's your first fantasy wild card? My first fantasy wild card is a guy who busted in the NFL uh, from his incredible high pedigree, coming in drafted to be a superstar, and unfortunately, Devonte Parker just wasn't good. And then, all of a sudden, five years later, <laughs> he's great. <laughs> He finishes the season as the wide receiver seven, and he was he was better than you remember. I mean, you remember that he had a breakout campaign, but you're talking about a guy who from week four, remember the first three weeks, this is the Josh Rosen experiment and the back and forth. They're not sure who the My least favorite are. experiment. Just for the record, the yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. Um, but from week four on, that is the majority of the season. Devonte Parker, do you guys know where he ranked for the, you know after pretty week much four? the whole season? After week four, week four on, take your guess where Devonte Parker ranked at wide receiver. N- number one in my heart. <laughs> number one in your heart. Michael Thomas will ensure he is not number one in reality in fantasy. But that's it. He's number two. He's he number was the two. wide receiver two oh from week gosh. four uh, through week seventeen. I mean, and and here's the deal. He's coming back with another year of experience. Ryan Fitzpatrick is still there. Uh, I mean, if you're telling me, yeah, I know. <laughs> if you're telling me that a guy who was drafted to be great, who was great for the entire season, he from that point on, he only had one bad game in week 14. That's uh, Michael Thomas in that stretch had two bad games, week 13 and week 17. So Devontae Parker showed that he can be that guy. He has currently the starting quarterback that he did that with. Uh, he's going to take another step forward except they drafted Tua, and 
Preston Williams was injured, you know, halfway through the season. So uh, Parker's target volume went up and you have four seasons of Parker stinking. Uh, so it's like the range of outcomes on Devontae Parker is very difficult. I left this season wanting Devontae Parker to be someone on my roster uh, coming into 2020. And in this offseason, while statting these guys out, I'm not bullish on Devontae Parker. I think there are way too many variables, and I believe that changing from Fitzpatrick to Tua will be devastating for Devontae Parker's fantasy value. I don't think Parker has gotten to the stage where whoever is quarterback, he's going to make good enough. But, that, I mean, the I mean, we know his range of outcome, right? right. I mean, he was the wide receiver seven on the season and that was while the first three weeks he basically wasn't there wide receiver two after that um he's uh he's he is the definition of a wow card. yeah it's tough and, and this is one of those situations where i kind of applaud the draft community for regulating the value of Devonte parker i think right now he's the wide receiver 22 off the board fifth round pick uh he's our consensus 22 so it's the exact kind of spot that he belongs right now with those variables in place. I think Miami's a much better team. I think they've got a much improved defense. I think their running game might exist this year. Sure. I mean, having a running game that does exist would be good as opposed to <laughs> the Bellage experience. I mean, you have both Howard and Breida there. So those are some things that were not in place last year. I, I, I agree. He's a wild card. Because yeah. you you've had seasons where players have done this and and that emergence it persists, and you've had players that are a flash in the pan and disappear. I mean, sure, it's difficult. Sure, I will jump in here. The first player I want to highlight, running back for the Baltimore Ravens, Mark Ingram, who was a top ten running back last year, but he did so on a volume that seems like it just can't possibly happen again but it <laughs> but, but it could it happen can. Again. like we're, when i'm looking at Devonte parker and i'm saying okay is top 10 is it realistic sure it could happen but i i just don't think it's a realistic outcome for this year with all the variables with that team there's there aren't variables for the baltimore ravens in fact their defense has gotten gotten better if they want to just fully commit to the ground game and deep and the defensive side of the ball, they could do it. Last year, Ingram had over a thousand yards on the ground, just over two hundred carries, but ten rushing touchdowns. And this is in fifteen games. He got hurt at the very end of the season. On top of that, he had five receiving touchdowns on twenty nine targets. That's that is insanity. You have the but you have all the regression. That seems to be coming for the Baltimore Ravens offense. Last year, the Ravens scored 531 points. Over the last five years, we see on average about 1.2 teams a year scoring over 500 points. And we haven't seen a repeat in the last five years. Will the Ravens be the team that does? Will they, will they be able to not have a letdown after the success of, of last year and now they, they drafted J.K. Dobbins. They have... Uh, who who the fantasy community is absolutely in love with. Yes. The destination situation. And as am I. But And that's one of those variables of like, did, did they spend a day to pick on J.K. Dobbins to get him involved right away? Or is it still going to be primarily Mark Ingram? And then on the, on the fact that Mark Ingram was very old. <laughs> For a running back, he didn't look like it last year. He was he was unbelievably elusive, but he like eventually these guys get get too old to be playing the running back position at that level. So I just I don't know what to do with Mark Ingram, and the, I don't think fantasy players do as well right now in best ball draft. He's being taken as the the RB twenty eight despite finishing too low. as a top 10 running back. That's probably too low for this yes. year. What's crazy to me is that when I think of Baltimore's efficiency, their offense, it brings me back to the Saints running game that once had Mark Ingram in it, where <laughs> right. Mark Ingram was underrated and undervalued year in and year out yes. because he partially shared a backfield, but that backfield was perennially efficient. And, and they're dominant. And he, and was. Dominant. he was perennially efficient. Yes. He... 
year after year after year after year outperforms his ADP. He'll do it again this year if he's the running back 28 in ADP, but you're still limiting the upside of uh, Dobbins, the timeshare, the regression. So yeah, I, I, I totally get this one. Mark Ingram is a guy that um, when I think about the players I really want on my team, he doesn't, he's not there. But then it's like, yeah, I don't want a guy who's always doing very good on a really <laughs> high-powered offense. Why? That's dumb. I would say that if, if he suffers an injury this year, they have the personnel to make a return to like a high workload, a lower probability. Does that make sense? Where like if he goes down and Dobbins comes in and further establishes himself and you have the other uh, pieces in place, maybe that's the pathway for Ingram. But you don't predict. You don't base your projection. Right. For a player that is that uh, valuable, on maybe he'll get injured and not come back. Yep, it's tough. Mark Ingram is tough. Yeah, so uh, he he is certainly a wild card, and he feels right now to me like a player that I probably have too low, right? Because of uh, the fact that, like you said, I mean, he, the Ravens are probably not going to have the offensive season they had last year. It just it doesn't matter who you are; you just don't generally run it back. Yeah, I so have, to speak. right now I have Mark Ingram at 22 as of the time of this recording, and I'm looking at it going, man, that it's too low. It's it's just too low. I got to go look at his projection. Preaching to yourself? Yes. Sometimes, look, sometimes <laughs> I use the show yes. as a way. I'm not actually talking to anybody. I'm talking into my reflection in my laptop yeah. here. Well, sometimes it needs – that's the whole point of this episode yeah. is to kind of walk through these and see how we feel. Julian Edelman is the player I'm going to bring up. Nice. He loses Brady. We have no knowledge or history of, of Stidham having success in the NFL. Could be a completely run-dependent team with a great defense. He's 34 years old, and we've talked about his injury history. And yet, he's coming off 100 catches, 1,100 yards, six touchdowns. And we bring up time and again, like, it doesn't matter how good or bad your team is. If you're the guy at the wide receiver position, there's value there. I, I started to think about, remember Terrell Pryor's kind of banner uh, yes. year? That's when he was Terrell Pryor. Yeah, one year in Cleveland. <laughs> you get caught Thank you, Jason. <laughs> and one year in Cleveland on a bad team, but he was the player, right? right? So I wonder if, because we have Julian Edelman at 34 in our consensus rankings. Mike, you're the highest, not surprisingly, at 30. But that's not very high, right? And then, at, and his ADP is at thirty-five. He's an eighth-round pick. Is there any doubt that Julian Edelman's the number one target for New England? No, not for me. So you have all those variables that you know that the the wheels could come off. But when you're coming off a hundred and eleven hundred and six, the and also just to highlight, you know, because like, Julian Edelman, the same is the same argument can be made about Mark Ingram. Like man, Edelman is just he's older. You realize that was the most receiving yards that he has ever had in a season last year? <laughs> like that's that's where the blinders, the, the the age blinders can come on. Yes. So I think part of what makes me resist Edelman is ceiling. Because okay, yes, he had a great year last year. So he comes back with Stidham. And what does he give you? If he gives you eighty for eight hundred and three, are you happy? Probably not. Or what's his ADP? Where is he at right now? Eighth round. You're definitely not happy if he gives you 80 for 803. Uh, I, maybe. In a PPR league, just knowing that that would be a consistent performer uh, of for my team. It, so 100 receptions last year. What If I said over under 85. Mm, I would take the under. I've got him at 78 for 837 yards and four touchdowns, and that puts him at my wide receiver 41. Yeah, so maybe this is a, in... this sounds like a wild card discussion that's leading towards. I have. I'll take the over on that one. You would take the over yeah. on 85. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right. Well, it, <laughs> I was thinking maybe. I mean, it's been a little while since you guys put one on the board. Do you guys want to go head to head on 85 receptions? How many, how many receptions do you have in four J? I have him for 78 receptions. Yeah, all right. 85 works. You want it, Jay? Uh, sure, but this carries with it uh, no no injury uh, qualification here because he usually – I mean, 12 games two years ago, nine games four years ago, 14 – you know, he misses time. He, 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 and so, You're the man taking the under. Why are you giving another term? <laughs> 
No, I'm saying I don't want it to be if he misses games, he's out of it because he was on a pace to have more than 85. Oh, so he's saying that no matter what happens, you're the under. If he gets injured, it still counts. Mike, you comfortable? Yeah, that's fine. Water bet. All right, Jason, give me another wild card. Oh, this one's uh, Julian Edelman's missing. Julian Edelman's missing this man. Yes, this is uh, the reason I'm taking the under is because Tom Brady is no longer throwing him the ball. But when it comes to Tom Brady, what a wild card! We we already talked earlier. Twelve personnel. Is it? Are they? Are they going to move away from what they did last year with Jameis Winston? I mean, obviously, it's a it's a whole new quarterback. Are they going to use Bruce Arians' system? Are they going to use Tom Brady's system? Tom Brady is old, but now you're telling me that you give the greatest quarterback of all time a gunslinging offense. He wants the challenge. He His goal is to leave the Patriots, leave Bill Belichick, and show that he is the reason for their success. He wants to take Tampa Bay to a Super Bowl. If you look at the Vegas odds, they're pretty high up there in, in uh, you know, uh, as far as finishing in the running for a Super Bowl. He has... Chris Godwin, he has Mike Evans, he has Gronkowski, he's got O.J. Howard. The weapons are the best he's had in forever, and this is an offense now that is going to be the the piece of this team that wins. So I could see, I mean, when I finished statting out Tom Brady in the Ultimate Draft Kit, my goodness, I was I was scared of my ranking. I think I had him at, at five or six, and I, I have moved him down a, a little bit, uh, to just be a little bit more realistic with the risk involved, but that's that's the other side. You can't ignore the fact that he's changing teams. He's changing players completely. He has no rapport with anyone outside of Gronk. He is We've yet to have a 40, training camp or three hundred years old, um, <laughs> and and that's the real issue here. Is that let, let me read you? Those aren't plant years, though, read, Jason. He's twenty. Yeah. He's twenty six in plant years. That's in plant years. Yes, that's that's good. He is the plant man. <laughs> Um, here, here's some stats for you. 4,659 passing yards, 5,477 passing yards, 4,727 passing yards. Those are good. Those are good numbers, right? Great. Yeah. Everything those is great. Are very good. 3,598 passing yards. Not as good. Yards. Lower. Not Much as good. Lower okay. Number. Let me, let me, let me try some touchdowns. 37 touchdowns. Uh, Would you like yeah, that? Yeah. Oh, that'd be great. I like that. How about, how about... 55. Uh, Ooh. I would like that very yeah, much. Yeah, you like that. How about 39? Also excellent. Oh, those are great. How about 14? Lower. You want 14? That's lower. <laughs> no? Okay, final final stat here. Final stat. Let's look at the uh, interceptions. How about 11? That's a That's low fair. number. You want that? How about 10? Fair. Oh, yeah, better. That's good. 15, 15 yeah, whatever. Yeah, all right, How about, all right. okay, last number, 27. This is what happened to Peyton Manning when the wheels fell off. And I am not reading you his shortened season games. I'm saying the 16-game pace of Peyton Manning mm. that final year was 3,500 yards, 14 touchdowns, and 27 interceptions. And that was right after incredible excellence, uh, you know, otherworldly first ballot Hall of Fame performance. So when that season, when the end comes for Tom Brady, it will come. It will not be kind. It will come <laughs> with Thor's hammer, and it will destroy uh, Tom Brady's fantasy value. So all of that's baked in, but I look at a Bruce Arians-led offense, a Tom Brady uh, great quarterback with all these weapons, and I am banking on a high performance. <laughs> I drafted him. We uh, were in a Fantasy Cares Eliminator that's going on right now. And I actually, through that draft, drafted the Tom Brady Gronkowski stack. Mm. So I, you know, and and that that's my action. I, you know, when when you're talking about these wild cards, you got to make your bet. I am betting on Tom Brady. I believe it's going to happen. But these Peyton Manning stats. Well, look at Brett, all the Brett Favre had those stats too. I mean, Brett Favre went from a 4,233 touchdown, seven interception season, to in 13 games, 2,511 with 19 interceptions. So the wheels fell off quickly yeah, so for him, just, too. It's, it's just predicting the year, and um, I do not predict it to be this year, but my goodness, if you're wrong on this bet, you're not going to be like, well, he was okay. I'm curious. It's, it's going to be bad. I'm curious of what people will do with a hot start, too. I wonder if that's like the yeah. poison for fantasy. If he starts hot the, in those first couple start. weeks and you buy into what you saw in those couple games, 
You could be real trapped I'm into like, him. You're curious? You know what the answer will be. The, the, hot, the plant hot, man reigns. The hot start is the poison for any player. Yeah, you're right. As, as soon as I see week one and week two, I have I have ripped my pants off, and I'm running down the streets declaring my victory because this player is a success. Weeks one and two are very trepidatious as a fantasy. They get us all, man. As a fantasy analyst, too. Because Oh, we, yeah, Sammy Watkins last yeah. night? Oh, yeah. Yes. I had to decide whether to just take it on the chin. Oh, I'm super wrong about Sammy. Yeah. It didn't feel good. No, it'll it'll happen. All right, Mike, you've got one more. I've got one more. All right. uh, I'm going to talk about DK Metcalf, wide receiver from the Seattle Seahawks, because what is he going to be? He feels like a player, and right now in best ball, he's going as the wide receiver 21. Last year, he finished as the, the wide receiver 32, is... What could DK Metcalf become? Because he's he is a super he's a superhero of of a man. Uh, but Tyler Lockett is there. Last year, DK Metcalf, nine hundred yards, seven touchdowns on an, on hundred targets, fifty eight receptions. This was also the most passing yards by Russell Wilson in the last three years. And we've we've also been here before where the the young stud, we look we look to him and project that he's going to overtake the veteran, which it was Tyler Lockett. Is he going to surpass Doug Baldwin and be the number one wide receiver for Seattle? Time after time, we met made that bet, or some people made that bet, and they were wrong every single time. Tyler Lockett's very, very good. Can DK Metcalf take that jump from 900 yards and seven and really break out? I went and I looked at... Uh, like the combination of yards for Russell Wilson's top two targets. And it's been very similar. The, the, the actual percentage of the production. So last year, DK and Lockett, they were 48% of Russell Wilson's yardage. In 2018, the top two targets, 46%, 43%, 49%. Like this is what happens where two guys will soak up nearly 50% of the of Russell Wilson's yards, but then there's going to be a lot of players on that team who end up with 300 yards, 400 yep. yards, because Russell Wilson's really good at finding the open player. So why I'm bringing that up is how does DK Metcalf make the jump into superstardom, but seeing what he's been able to do on the field as, as a rookie, he could. Like if if you if you bet wrong on DK Metcalf. You could be very, very wrong. He could be a top 15 guy, but it's it's hard to project that path when Tyler Lockett is still on the team. I feel like Metcalf, the challenge with him is he doesn't need to produce more than he did last year for this team to be great. Sure. They don't need him to do more than catch 60 passes for 900 to 1,000 yards, be a goal line presence, catch six or seven touchdowns. They're not building an offense around DK Metcalf. That offense is Russell Wilson's, the running game, and all those pieces that you talked about. Because the best quarterbacks, and Brady did this for years, they could distribute the ball to 15 players over the course of a season that are relevant and catch touchdowns. So that is the risk factor because anytime a player comes into year two after a great rookie season, we all get big eyes. We all get excited about the potential. And he has it. He's got the potential. But does it necessitate this team turning the keys over to Russell and the passing game for him to meet it? And it's it's like those it's it's touchdowns where I agree with you. I'm I don't see a way that DK Metcalf jumps from 900 yards up to like 1200, 1300 no. yards. I just don't see that happening. But could DK Metcalf have a one of those insane Doug Baldwin touchdown years where I think Baldwin had what 14 touchdowns in one year? 15 was it? It could happen. Like he's the type of player that. It that that could happen with so I just his range of outcomes to me are 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 extreme both yeah. ways yeah right. I'm a Tyler Lockett believer so I think that's going to be what gets in the way of DK Metcalf sure. the, Tyler Lockett all he did the last two years was each of them be a top fifteen fantasy wide receiver and the clear number one target I, I think there's you know I I think uh, there's not there's not a reason to move away from that um, and so I'm I'm uh, more bullish on Tyler Lockett this season. Yeah, and in 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 another offense 
or another offensive system, you don't have to be here picking and choosing between the two, right? You don't have to like say Tyler Lockett's no right. good in order to make DK Metcalf great, but you feel like you have to in Seattle with the passing volume. But and what I'm saying is like right now, best ball wide receiver 21, he can't – Will he act? Will he even hit wide receiver twenty one? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Probably not the flag plant that I want this year. Sure, but I wish him the best. <laughs> he's good luck. He's a, good he's luck. Uh, also, Mike, you were correct. Baldwin had fourteen touchdowns in, in your face. How's that feel, Jay? In, 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 well, I said it, so it's in my own face. I'm fine. <laughs> Jared Cook is the final oh. wild card. I want to mention. Uh, is this Jared Cook? Is this Jared Cook? I don't know. And he has, if, if you wanted to say, give me a fantasy wild card over the last like seven years, Jared Cook should be making that list. Sure. We've had high expectations. We've had those high expectations not met. We've had great quarterback situations for Jared Cook before where those situations or those expectations were not met. Last year, 43 catches. That's it. 43 receptions, but nine touchdowns. Poof. And much like some of the other wild cards we've talked about, even Mark Ingram, the efficiency, the touchdown numbers, could that happen again? No question. It could happen again with Drew Brees in New Orleans. How will Emmanuel Sanders fit into that offense? How will the will this team, will the pendulum swing back to the rushing touchdowns that we saw from two years ago? Or will it be more like last year where it, they, they kind of disappeared, which affected Alvin Kamara? And affected, you know, the rushing touchdown totals, but mm -hmm. it really helped players like Jared Cook. So Jared Cook to me feels like the riskiest, and, and you might have him as a tier two tight end or a tier three, depending on where you have him ranked or how you think of him. But just forty three receptions last year. Let that settle in. You're not getting PPR value out of Jared Cook. Sure. He had games where he caught the ball one time. It just happened to be a touchdown. So from a wild card perspective, I have him the highest of the three of us. I like Jared Cook. I like the offense, and I like the predictability of it. But it still terrifies me a little bit because he's the kind of player that can be drafted at you know with one expectation. You lock him into your tight end slot, and then you feel trapped. You feel paralyzed to stream the tight end position because you invested draft capital on Jared Cook, and he's not giving you what you wanted. Right, like last year where... You, you, if you if you drafted OJ Howard last year, oh gosh! I mean, how, how how many how many weeks were you just banging your head up against the wall saying it's a he, lot of he's weeks? He's OJ Howard. He's a first round pick. All of the weeks. <laughs> so yeah, I, I get what you're saying. That's such a but, terrible but good comp for this situation. But at the, at the same time, you have uh, possibly the most accurate quarterback in the history of the NFL. If, and he's he's a good player. I mean, he finished right. like number five at the position two years ago. So those things stand out to me. When you have a low reception total at tight end, I get a little I get a little scared to invest a higher to, draft pick. To invest yeah. the higher draft pick. I'm with and you. lock him into the position. Mm -hmm. Would you feel better if he had say 56 receptions versus 43 receptions? Would that change your outlook on him being a very Touchdown if you, only. Yeah, if you had him around end. fifty-five to sixty, I'd, I'd feel more so comfortable. So, if you look at last year's game, is that logs, his projection? Remember, you know, the, well, no, that was that was last year. What happened? Obviously, Drew Brees comes in and gets injured, and then Teddy takes over. Drew Brees comes back in Week Eight. Cook was not there yet. When Cook gets back in Week Ten, Game Nine, and plays uh, through the rest of the season, they were on a fifty-six reception, seventy-six target pace which would have been a thousand yards and 14 touchdowns granted there's a lot of changing parts here Alvin Kamara's health Emmanuel Sanders, yeah, added Sanders to the team. So I, I agree this is, is a wild card but Jared Cook was very good <laughs> during the, the last part of that season yeah he was he was he was outstanding and he was consistent I mean you look at his week-to-week -week consistency chart yep. in the UDK and he was one of the more consistent tight ends at the position I have him down for 50 receptions on the dot this year mm. So, you know, I do you think he's going to pull down another nine touchdowns? I don't. That's a tough bet. Think so, but that's a tough bet. Yeah, but he's he's I've not very much nine. different than. Oh, what was the total receptions for? I'm trying to remember for Mark Andrews. I mean, Mark Andrews last year 
was at Marking, 64. Yeah. Okay, so significantly higher in 15 games. Right. But any other thoughts on Jared Cook? Nope. I think you laid him out well. All right, I think we're going to close this thing down. I want to thank uh, Pristine Auction, sponsor of today's show. Le'Veon Bell signed full-size pylon. Did you hear that? A signed Wait, a pylon? A signed pylon. Really? That's How cool. much do you have to pay for a signed pylon? Well, I hope it's somewhere like two, between 50 and $60. Oh! $55.28. Hundreds of interesting, cool sports memorabilia items at pristineauction.com. Use the code BALLERS. Get a $10 credit. That'll do it for us. It's been fun. It, it, these are some fun players to talk about. Yes, I like talking about the wild cards. We'll see you in a couple days, Foot Clan. Be safe. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. And Foot Clan, do not forget Omaha Steaks will deliver the world's best steaks and a huge variety of other favorites directly to your dad's door in time for Father's Day. Omaha Steaks delivers guaranteed quality and safety with every order, so send Dad a gift of food he'll love this year. Make Father's Day simple this year and send Dad the gift he really wants. Mike, that's meat. He really wants I meat. want meat. Perfectly aged Omaha Steaks. Get free shipping and free steak cut bacon with select packages. Visit omahasteaks.com and type footballers in the search bar to see their variety of amazing packages.